Hey everybody, it's CVH here, and for today's video I'm going to be doing something that I've been meaning to do for a while actually. It was originally a suggestion uh, from someone who uh, responded when I was asking for topics for videos people might want to see, might help the community, uh, and this suggestion was the top five common mistakes that I see in Elder Scrolls Legends along with how to fix them. Uh, so as you guys might know, I've been playing this game for a while. I started when the NDA was lifted and people could start streaming and recording content in late July 2016. I've been playing very consistently since then, uh, and I've basically, over the course of however many months that's been, a little bit over half of a year, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, you wind up seeing people make a lot of mistakes. You wind up making a lot of mistakes yourself, seeing your, your opponents make them. Uh, and, of course, these are mistakes that I mention when I stream, when I do videos. A lot of the time you might have heard me briefly touch on them. I don't go too in-depth. Uh, but I thought I might talk about some of the more common ones that I've seen with the help of some handy-dandy uh, guides, you know, cards to illustrate my point. And uh, some of them will be game-specific to Legends, some of them will be more wide and relate to a variety of card games you might have played in the past. Uh, but I might want to just go into detail a little bit about how to fix them, because these are pretty common mistakes that I see a lot of newer players make especially. Uh, some exceptions to these rules that I'll be sort of laying out here and, uh, you know, how people might go about improving. So with that being said, uh, yeah, it is worth noting also that uh, throughout all five of these that I'll be mentioning, I'll be mentioning them in sort of an order, but, um, you know, these are all mistakes that people make at different points in their in their card game life. Uh, but there are exceptions to each of, the, each of these rules. When I say something is wrong, of course, uh, I think the most important thing to understand first and foremost is that uh, it's very tricky to deal in absolutes in card games. So when I say something is always or never right, I'll be trying to sort of find examples where the, 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 the basic rule that I'll be laying out could be broken, and it's correct to be broken in some of those cases. So very much take everything in sort of a case-by-case -case basis uh, type of mentality going forward. So with that being said, first, the, uh, the first thing we're actually going to get into, number five here, will be drawing last. And this is one of those rules that uh, it is definitely not legend specific. This is something, if you play any card game, or have played any card game in the past, You've probably heard people talk about drawing last, why it's bad. Uh, if you come from Hearthstone, the Warlock Hero Power, you, you tap it and uh, life tap. You pay two life and draw a card. A lot of people get on other people's cases if they tap last, so to speak, because you're drawing your card with your hero power after doing other things. That's basically what drawing last is. And uh, instead of drawing last, I guess we could say not drawing first, because typically the problem with drawing last is that you are making plays without having all of the options. So when you're drawing last, let's use Thieves Guild Recruit as, as an example. So you have a handful of four or five options. You already have, a, say, a five Magicka. You already have a three Magicka play in your hand that you're probably going to make, regardless of what that might be. Uh, let's say it's a Young Mammoth. You already have Young Mammoth in your hand. You're playing Ramp Scout. So you play the Young Mammoth after you draw your Thieves Guild Recruit. You're like, oh, okay, now that I have a, a three drop and a two drop, I can play both of these. So you play your Young Mammoth for three Magicka. You spend the additional two Magicka to play Thieves Guild Recruit. You draw a card. It's a Tree Minder. Uh, so why might this be a problem? Well, Young Mammoth and Thieves Guild Recruit, in this particular example, in this particular card draw card, they might have fit into the turn correctly. Um, but it's not totally clear whether or not the Young Mammoth was the absolute best play in your hand. You made that play without having all of the options, since it was clear you were going to play the Thieves Guild Recruit, thus giving yourself another option in your hand. Uh, a problem this might arise, might arise from this being if you had played the Thieves Guild Recruit first, uh, drawing the Tree Minder, for example, you could reassess your options at that point and uh, really think about which was the correct play after the, uh, the Thieves Guild had been played. Maybe if you had a 7-drop in your hand, such as Nog Leave, you really wanted to play the following turn if Young Mammoth wasn't really doing too much on the board if you didn't get to trade, maybe the Tree Minder would have been the correct play. And of course, you know, you, you filled out your turn, you used your magic effectively, the math sort of checked out there, and that's great and everything, uh, but it is 100% if you're able to, uh, it's 100% just straight up better to have all of the options, all of the information um, go moving forward with your turn. Uh, and, uh, you know, a little discrepancy some players might make. If you have a cunning ally in your hand, or, or like one of these sort of RNG or luck-based effects, a lot of people will gravitate towards them first and say, well, I need to see if this ally hits. And uh, that's something that people learn pretty quickly early on, that, you know, in order to decide the rest of your turn, in order to decide whether or not you're going to firebolt something, you need to decide whether cunning ally is going to give you a firebolt first. And drawing last is sort of the same situation, just a much wider scope, because you are uh, dealing from anything that you could possibly draw on your deck. And uh, this can even be a wider scope when you're thinking about other RNG-based cards. Drawing last really just means making plays before you have all the information. And information can come from a variety of places, not just drawing from the top of your deck. Uh, so, for example, if you're playing uh, Royal Sage this turn, 
a lot of the time you're going to want to play the royal sage and see what you get before you play additional spells if something gets lethal you don't need to use a removal spell or removal action like piercing javelin on it instead of trading into your lethal. Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can think about this. Obviously, Blood Magic Lord, uh, RNG-based effects. There's a lot of RNG-based effects that uh, do impact the game, and in order to get your maximum percentage points out of all of them, you will generally want to have the information first. Now, like I said, there are definitely exceptions to all of these rules, uh, including this playing things before having all of the information. And it might seem, now that you're thinking about this, well, why would I ever play something without having all the information if it seems so obvious? And there are other things to take into account as well, such as number four on my list, which is playing things before attacking and breaking a rune. Uh, so this is one of the more game-specific things in Elder Scrolls Legends, because obviously runes don't really exist in any other card game. Uh, they're equivalent, sort of, in games like Duel Masters and Kaijudo, but runes are pretty much game-specific to Legends. Uh, and what happens when you break a rune is your opponent draws a card from the top of their deck, and if it has Prophecy, they get to play it for free on the spot immediately on whoever's turn it may be. Whether it be their turn and they're breaking their own rune somehow, or your turn when you're attacking them. So when you attack and you break a rune, you invite the possibility of any Prophecy that they could be playing in their deck and the, within their class or in neutral colors uh, to happen to you on the spot. Um, and the problem with this is if you're playing something before, let's say, well, you obviously already have something on the board that you can attack with unless you're just playing a, a creature with charge. Uh, but let's say you're going to be attacking your opponent with this young mammoth or something that's going to be breaking their rune and giving them an extra card. You know this. Uh, but in order to see, um, first you want to draw a card. Let's say you play Blood Magic Lord. You're like, well, I want to have all the options in my hand. So I'm going to see what Blood Magic spell Blood Magic Lord gets me. With all of my nine magic, I'm going to use my turn for this purpose. And you play Blood Magic Lord. And you see, okay, maybe you get Corpse Curse, whatever you might get. Happy with it. Attack, break the rune. You hit a Piercing Javelin. The only two things on your board are the Mammoth and the Blood Magic Lord. Obviously, your opponent's going to be choosing the more threatening card, the Blood Magic Lord, and it's going to be gone immediately. Whereas if you had waited to play it until after the rune break, it wouldn't be gone. Obviously, there are times when it's correct to play some creatures before you break runes, uh, and sometimes when you're, trying, when you're supposed to wait. And uh, a lot of the reason I'm mentioning this is because... While people normally um, do decide to draw last, uh, they also decide to play things before attacking runes. Um, occasionally it's right when it's a draw card, occasionally it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, Blood Magic Lord can sometimes make sense if whether or not you get a certain Blood Magic spell or a certain RNG effect on your card dictates whether or not you make that face attack, uh, but a lot of times if you're simply playing a vanilla or some guard, uh, let's say you're both trying to protect one lane against your opponent killing you on the following turn, and you're trying to pressure them in the other lane, playing the guard first really doesn't make any sense whatsoever, because you're just inviting the possibility of them getting some removal action that they would then use on the guard, when otherwise, if they had not known what you were going to do with your entire turn, they would have used it on the creature. Now, of course, that's basically the worst case scenario is just losing the game on the spot or being put in an exponentially worse situation because of that. But even in the Blood Magic Lord example, the point, even if you weren't drawing a card or whatever it might be, you used a lot of your Magicka before you had all the options. And in that way, it's really like the whole drawing last thing, where you're making a play using using your resources, which is your Magicka in this case. Uh, even if it doesn't get removed, you're making a play before you have all the options. Let's say you play a creature, you attack a rune, and the prophecy doesn't remove what you played. It's not that detrimental but maybe it's a prophecy creature. And they then, now that your opponent has the information of how you spent your magicka for the turn, they can then allocate uh, whichever lane they want for the creature. Instead of maybe contesting, uh, maybe giving you the opportunity if they had put it in the shadow lane, then you could then contest it in the shadow lane. But if you've already spent your magicka, uh, you don't really give yourself a chance to respond to whatever variance has in store for you, which is uh, a lot of different options when you're breaking your opponent's rune in this game. Uh, and a lot of people do complain about the rune system a lot, and it is kind of one of my pet peeves because while people complain about it a lot, I do notice a lot of these simple mistakes happening on the ladder at Legend, at High Legend, uh, with, with all kinds of players of all um, times in the game, people who have been playing it for a long time. Like These are just mistakes that are basically very, very present in the game, and I think that's a main one that people need to really think about is uh, you know, really deciding what they're going to do for the turn, but then allowing variance to take its chance or take its toll on your turn and, and then assess the options once you know uh, as much of the concrete information as the game will allow you to know. So moving on, um, sort of in the same vein as playing things before attacking runes, we have number three, which is not trading before breaking runes. And this is sort of the same, same basic idea. You can probably already get the general idea of this bullet point from the last one, 
and uh, it basically involves trading creatures versus your opponent's creatures. There are a lot of times when you are both having to trade uh, your creature into your opponent's creature and having to make some face attacks. Let's say you have an, an uncontested lane and a contested lane. You have a favorable trade, you really want to make it, uh, but you also want to attack your opponent's face and break the runes. Now, this is when the rules start to sort of conflict, and in order to really maximize your chances of getting the most you want done in a turn, um, you really have to know what specific cards are out there, which possible prophecies could stop what you're what you're planning to do and then you have to assess and it gets very difficult you have to assess which is the most important what do you need to have happen in a turn what is the most important thing to your current game plan and moving forward how do you win the game uh but yeah so a lot of the time you might be looking at the past the past bullet point and saying well uh maybe whether or not i trade is dictated by what i hit my opponent's rune and, and what what comes out maybe there's another prophecy creature that comes out they decide to contest and then i trade with that or maybe they play uh some sort of uh some sort of action and I decide that it's best to just keep pressuring my opponent if they do something like that. Well, you also invite the opportunity of them shackling, removing, or, or shackling, destroying, or otherwise removing the creature that was going to trade. So if you have a trade that's clear on board, uh, most of the time it is better to take that trade before attacking your opponent's face and uh, allowing a potential prophecy to basically negate the trade you would have had. Just stop it in its tracks. Uh, if you have a young mammoth that's going to trade into something, I'm just using young mammoth because it's the first basic creature that I can really think of, but if you break your opponent's rune with something else before your young mammoth gets to trade into their cunning ally, maybe they, you hit a lightning bolt, maybe that lightning bolt kills your mammoth, and then all of a sudden the ally is just there, when otherwise it would have been a pretty free kill. And of course, as with all these rules, uh, there are times when you don't, like maybe uh, you're breaking the rune, buffed up your mortal executioner to a 4-4 and allowed it to trade in the first place, of course there are case-by-case -case times to avoid what I'm saying, but as a general rule, making trades before breaking runes, in much the same way as playing things before attacking and breaking a rune uh, might hurt based on them removing the creature you were just playing, um, not trading before breaking a rune can be detrimental to your overall strategy if they're able to remove the creature that you are going to take a much needed trade with. So those are things to think about. So moving on to number two on the list, and this is again, along with the last two, something that's pretty specific to Elder Scrolls Legends, is not playing in the correct lane. So the lane system is is very, very sort of new um, for a lot of people. Nothing that I can tell from other card games really compares to the lane system. And when I first got into Legends, it was one thing that I wasn't totally sure if I would like. Uh, it's definitely grown on me since then. I enjoy the, 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 the level of comeback it allows, uh, the depth of strategy, obviously. Uh, there's a whole layer of strategy involving thinking through what you're going to play this turn, and then a whole extra layer in this game of thinking about placement. And not as much as in some of these board-type card games like Faria or Duelist. The lanes really keep it different enough to add some depth while keeping it similar enough to other card games that we might be familiar with that just have this sort of one-field system, such as Magic the Gathering, Kaijudo, Hearthstone, etc. If you're not familiar with the lane system, if you're literally just getting into the game, a creature that you have in the left lane can only attack creatures in that lane or your opponent's face unless they otherwise say so, like Blood Dragon, for example. Creatures in the right lane can only attack creatures in that same lane or your opponent's face unless a creature otherwise says so, like Blood Dragon. Uh, the right lane also is the Shadow Lane in um, currently all constructed games. Maybe this changes in the future, but Shadow Lane, when you play a creature there, it gets cover, which means it cannot be attacked for one turn. Uh, unlike Stealth and Hearthstone, they can still be targeted by actions and abilities. Uh, they just can't be attacked for one turn, and then the following turn, or until they attack. If you play a charge creature in the Shadow Lane, once it attacks, it loses cover. But you can't just have a creature sit there for turns on ends, one, turn on turns on end without attacking. It won't retain cover on your next turn. It won't have cover anymore, regardless of whether or not you attack with it. So this introduces a lot of different. Um, different lines you could possibly take, obviously, like I said. Uh, and one of the main things I see is a misplacement of a creature on the first turn of the game. Uh, and it was kind of questionable to me when I first started. I didn't really know where to play things, and it can seem a little bit daunting. You know, I've talked to some new players, and that's one of the things, like, I, well, I'm just overwhelmed. There's, like, the normal decisions I already have, plus where do I put things? How do I know if I'm really making the optimal placement? And a lot of the time it's going to come down to just playing around certain cards, but I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is where do you play the first creature? So this can change based on your strategy, what cards are released, I'm sure there'll be more lane specific effects in the future, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, if I'm against a clear board, obviously if my opponent has something in either lane, I have to think about that and what I want to do with that, whether or not I want to contest it or whether I want to race it and, or just set up in a different lane entirely. 
and that goes into what strategy they're playing, what I'm playing, etc. But as a general rule of thumb, the first creature I play against a clear board will go into the left, the field lane, without cover, without any of those extra frills, basically. So what happens in that lane? Well, I have a creature. My opponent can either contest that creature with their own creature in the field lane, uh, or they can play in the shadow lane away from my creature. If they play in the field lane, if they can test my creature, then the turn passes back to me, and I get to decide whether or not I want to trade with their creature, if it's a trade that I want to make, or if I go face. If they play in the shadow lane, then I can play a shadow lane creature second in the shadow lane. Then they won't be able to attack my creature, because my creature will have cover unless silenced, and then on my turn, I can again decide whether or not I want to trade with their creature that will no longer have cover, or if I want to go face. If you play the second thing in the shadow lane, you generally have control over what happens to the things. If you play the first creature in the field lane, that's generally what happens. So I see it a lot of times where people will play a sort of high value card in the shadow lane when they already had something in the field lane. And again, there are definitely times that you need to take into consideration, that you need to identify what your opponent could have. For example, Territorial Viper, good removal. It is a charge. It will not be able to kill something that you just played in the shadow lane, but it will be able to kill with lethal something that you just played in the field lane. And other things that have charge that can just attack over things, obviously you need to take those into consideration. And your general strategy moving forward, where you want to develop, what where things matter. But as general rule of thumb, things in the shadow lane, um, they might seem safer, but let's say you already have something in the field lane. Uh, and it's pretty beefy, it can it can take some trades, and the, the field lane besides that is empty on both your and your opponent's side. If you develop, for example, a goblin skulk that you want to protect for multiple turns, if you develop that in the shadow lane, it's probably going to get that one attack in, but it's probably going to die immediately after, because your opponent's going to immediately contest the shadow lane. You're going to attack their face, get your effect, and that's probably the only use you're going to get out of it, because your opponent's going to just simply attack over your skulk. If you played it in the field lane, uh, barring a charge, like I said, your opponent could then contest the field lane, but you can immediately attack those creatures, so if you had anything else in the field lane whatsoever, you can already use that to take care of their guy, and perhaps you can keep your high-priority card alive for multiple turns on end. And that's just about protecting your high-priority cards, uh, but there are also mistakes to be made throughout all stages of the game, the lanes, uh, really should impact your decision making. Whenever you can play a creature, you should actually just give yourself a couple seconds and think about whether or not it makes more sense in the left, in the right, or just not being played at all, obviously, but that should already be the first thought process of whether or not you should play something. But there are innumerable things to think about and play around. The cards that are released now, I'm sure, only scratch the surface of what'll be released in the future when it comes to cards that deal with the lanes. Dawn's Wrath, Immolating Blast, these are things I frequently try to play around, even in Arena, where they are less common because of their rarity. Uh, there are Arrow Storms, there are Chorus Reapers, there are all kinds of things. Uh, by my, I couldn't even think about them all. Firestorm, there's just a ton. So when you're playing anything that could be affected, just think about what it's likely your opponent has you know, you should be making reads on what your opponent potentially has and what cards they could be potentially playing, what they could be potentially holding throughout all stages of the game, and just try to give yourself the best possible chance. And there are times when you won't be able to play around everything. You know your opponent's playing that Dawn's Wrath probably in their control deck, but can you really afford to play around it all the time? Probably not. You could be saying, well, if I stockpile in this lane, I get blown out immediately by a Dawn's Wrath, whereas if I play it in this lane, I don't, but I give myself the best chance of actually killing my opponent in this lane, and that's the game plan I feel like I have to go with for percentage reasons, you know, that just seems like the best way I have to win the game at the moment, so I'm going to go with it. Again, you can't play around everything at all the time, but I do think people need to take a little bit more time and actually think about what things go in which lanes. So the last thing I want to talk about in the video, and problem number one, is identifying the beatdown, or the question, who is the beatdown? And uh, if you Google that phrase, you'll find a very helpful article about Magic the Gathering that kind of relates here. Uh, basically, it's deciding when to attack face and when to trade with other creatures. And this is something that is, again, something that relates to all card games, not necessarily just Elder Scrolls Legends like the lanes and the prophecy mechanics. Uh, so identifying the beatdown, or when you're supposed to attack, and the reason I want to bring this up is because I see a lot of sort of black and white discussion about this based on which deck you're playing. Obviously an aggro deck is probably better at and supposed to go face more, and a control deck is more likely to play the reactive, controlly, defensive game and not attack face quite as much. And uh, this is a problem that is compounded upon by the introduction of the runes in this game. Uh, because while decks behave, while aggro decks behave like aggressive decks and control decks behave like reaction de reactionary sort of decks, uh, reactive decks in many games such as Hearthstone and Magic, the introduction of the runes and the prophecy system, uh, they really do change things because not only do you have to 
basically play to your deck's strengths, but there are definite downsides to attacking face uh, put in place to sort of check aggression and steamrolling of games from the early points. So it can feel even less um, reasonable to go in as a control deck, not only is your game plan not really about getting aggressive, but it, there are actual risks involved in that. And uh, same with an aggressive deck. Uh, while you have those runes in place, you can. there's a lot of people that want to just stick to their game plan at all stages. You make that first attack despite it not being really relevant, where you know your opponent's heavy on prophecies. Uh, there are definitely times to go face and times to go trade in all styles of decks. And I think people just need to basically take a step back before every attack. Uh, much like they should step back before every play of a creature and think about which lane it goes in, people should probably take a few seconds and really think about what attacks should go where for the turn. And uh, I'll just give some examples of this. So in control decks, you typically don't want to play an aggressive strategy, but there are some control decks that are better at turning on the heat than others, and this totally depends on the matchup and the uh, the cards you're playing as well. But I found, for example, that when I was playing Ram Scout, a traditionally very slow deck that wins the game by ramping up to obscene amounts of Magicka through stalling and removing your opponent's board, and then playing a bunch of threats, uh, that I was pretty good at getting aggressive against other control decks that uh, maybe weren't so great at destroying multiple creatures on the board at the same turn. So I found the situation happening a lot, for example, against Control Spell Sword. And as long as I played around Dawn's Wrath and Immolating Blast and single removal, if I had amassed a board of, let's say, a Thor and Hist's Mage, a Preserve of the Root, and a Blood Magic Lord, a lot of players would just leave their opponents at 30 then. However, it is probably correct at a certain point to consider being that mid-range deck you have multiple threats on the board and going in. So I won a lot of games by that because opponents weren't really expecting me as a control deck to become an aggressor. And eventually someone's going to start having to attack and win the game, obviously. Uh, but in control decks there's a sort of stigma where you have to play the defensive game and in order to attack you have to have already ran your opponent completely out of cards, they have to be low on resources and have almost nothing left and then you're allowed to go in. And that's simply not the case. Sometimes it is more appropriate to just flood your opponent with answers if you have developed that many threats, and they probably won't have the Magicka or, you know, the proper answer for everything. And if they do, they won't have the Magicka to play everything, so you could actually just sort of push your opponent out of the game like that. And the same kind of holds true for aggro decks, especially in the aggro mirrors we find this as well. A lot of people will just default to the, uh, well, I'm an aggressive deck, I should be racing my opponent, I should be hitting face at every opportunity, uh, when in reality it's important to think about when to contest your opponent's creatures. And, you know, then you can get sort of stuck in that trap of, well, I've started to contest my opponent's creatures, and I should play the control game now. But every turn you should be analyzing whether or not it's appropriate to get aggressive. Sometimes trading is just not going to get the job done in time as an aggro deck, and you're going to have to just let your other aggro opponent try to race you and put them on a two-turn clock or whatever you might have. Uh, maybe hope for that lucky prophecy. Just actually try to run the numbers of what are the percent chances that I can kill them uh, if I trade? What if I go face? Do I have a prophecy that could save me? What if I hit the worst-case prophecy there? And just as well as you can, because it is very hard in the time allotted per turn, just try to figure out what the percentage best play is, what, which is going to give you the best percentage of winning the game over the long term. And uh, identifying who the beatdown is is something that can go a long way in helping you because it really does dictate your entire game plan. There are a lot of times when you're making the technically correct play, you're making the trades that look good, you're making the attacks that look good, but people don't really take a second to look back at the big picture. And I see a lot of people confused at why they lost, they have no idea, but they, you know, they're like, I made good trades, I made a good face attacks, but maybe you just didn't make them at the correct time. Yeah, the trade looked good, but maybe just going face and making your opponent make that trade for you is more correct. So a play can look technically correct while being big picture not correct. The difference between micro misplays and macro misplays. Uh, micro misplay would be simply drawing last or something when otherwise it would make no sense to draw last. And a macro misplay would be looking at the big picture, who's the beatdown, and then not acting appropriately. And as a quick aside, sort of, uh, about control decks especially, a lot of people always ask why control decks aren't attacking at the beginning of the game when it's very easy to get your opponent down to 26 life, especially uh, as that is the last life before a rune is broken on your opponent's side. And there are a lot of answers for this. I think people should really take a step back and think whether or not even the attacks that don't break runes are, are impactful, because a lot of the time they really are. If you get your opponent down to 26, for example, and then you want to drain with a Pillaging Tribune or some such card that needs to attack to drain, uh, if you're up against a clear board, you will be attacking, you will be breaking that rune. Whereas otherwise, even if you've let your opponent heal, you won't be breaking a rune right away. 
It's also important to consider cards with breakthrough, whether or not in the future you might be attacking over one of your opponent's creatures, and whether breakthrough matters and will give your opponent an additional card, whereas if you held back in the very early game, you would not. That could matter down the line. Also, self-damaging cards such as Gladiator's Arena and Afflicted Elite, if you get your opponent down to a number right above a rune break, they can have an easier time breaking their own rune, even with a Sharpshooter Scout. So these are things that control players should be thinking about from the very first turns of the game, even before the board state gets more complicated. That being said, that's pretty much all I have for this video. These are five uh, problems that I see, a lot of people, a lot of mistakes that people make. Uh, drawing last, playing things before attacking runes, not trading before breaking runes, uh, not playing in the correct lane a lot of the time, and identifying who is the aggressor and when you should be getting aggressive versus playing a more defensive role with your creatures and actions. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully uh, this allowed you to, to basically take a step back and look at things that you could be doing with your own game to improve. Uh, whether or not you're a new player, whether or not you're an experienced player, we should all be really thinking about these. These are, these are five things that I go through in my head every single turn of every single game, and a lot of the times when misplays are made on my end, I just simply thought too fast, I didn't give myself the amount of time I needed, and I skipped through one of these in my head, and a lot of the time obvious misplays can really Really just be fixed by forcing yourself to take 10 or 15 seconds before you make that play that looks obvious. And whether or not you change your mind on that play, it should at least allow you to analyze more sort of whatever possible repercussions your actions might have and how you might respond to that. Give yourselves more time. Hopefully these are five tips that you're uh, able to think about and hopefully you'll see a change in your gameplay as a result. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more strategy content, more deck techs, highlights from streams, etc. Follow the stream, I'll leave the link down below uh, for daily Legends streams, and I will see you guys next time.